This is the story of Ragnarok Season 2, Battle 6, where all the spectators gather to watch the sixth bout, as things are three in favor of the gods at this point, and two in favor of the humans. The Master of Ceremony introduces with much revelry and anticipation the representative of the gods, the unbeatable and fearsome Buddha. The humans are terrified to see that one of their favorite gods is about to fight against them, as they did not expect the man who led many to enlightenment to be the one to bury them. Buddha enters the ring and passes the corner of the gods, walking towards the corner of the humans. This displeases the master of ceremony and the gods themselves, who are left with their mouths open. Then, Buddha takes the megaphone from Heimdall and announces that he will represent the humans instead of fighting on the side of the gods. This creates chaos in the atmosphere, as everyone is used to Buddha breaking the rules and doing whatever he wants, but he has crossed a line this time. The little Valkyrie asks Brunhild if she knows anything about it, and a flashback reveals that Buddha announced his decision shortly before the sixth fight. Amidst the chaos, Zeus appears and explains to Heimdall that nowhere does it say that it is forbidden for a god to fight on the side of humans, even acknowledging that he would like to fight against him. Buddha looks at him defiantly and tells him that he hopes to beat the wrinkles out of him. However, Zeus will not be Buddha's opponent, as Buddha's real rival and replacement is on his way. Suddenly, Lights from the sky illuminate the battlefield as if they were searchlights and a flying boat descends gracefully while the gods insult Buddha and his entire family tree. The seven gods of fortune descend from the ship and provoke less fear in Buddha than a YouTuber playing horror games. But this will soon change, as Heimdall announces that a fight in numerical disadvantage is forbidden, and emphasizes that only one of the seven gods can fight. So the most muscular of the gods announces that in reality, they are only one. At that moment, the other gods enter the muscular body of the god and give light to the true identity of the deity, Zero Fuku. This god literally is the most fearsome god ever seen, even forging his weapon from his own sinews and veins. Gods and humans are terrified at the sight of Zero Fuku's sinister form, and Brunhilde explains to the lowly that Zero Fuku is the true form of the gods of fortune and is the result of the world's sorrow. A flashback sets the story in a remote time when humans and gods interacted. Zirofuku was known as the kindest and most innocent god of all, for he was like a child in love with life. In fact, when he descended from the territory of the gods to visit the humans, his heart was so moved by the sorrows and miseries they were going through that he decided to use his powers to absorb these misfortunes and alleviate them. Unfortunately, Carrying the pains and curses of humans in his body proved detrimental to him as his health deteriorated. However, bringing happiness to humans filled Zirofuku's heart. He believed that humans would be prosperous now that they were free from afflictions, so he went to visit them again and found the worst. They were evil and depraved. In fact, the child he had healed of his illness now despised him and looked down on him. This hurt Zirofuku's heart so much that he began to wonder if it was right to have taken all the misfortunes away from the humans. At that moment, a crowd of animals and men followed a guide in a single file. They looked ragged and unfortunate, but they looked happy and grateful, while the villagers Zirofuku had helped were an arrogant and envious bunch. Because of this, he goes over to talk to Buddha, the leader of the group. Buddha asks him if he wants to follow him, but Zerofuku asks him how he could make his disciples happy since he took away all their misfortunes, and it seems to have made them worse. Buddha replied that fortune is not something that can be given as a gift, but is something that people obtain by themselves by being grateful. Again, Buddha asked him if he wanted to follow him, but Zerofuku ran away with tears in his eyes feeling envious of Buddha's wisdom. Zerofuku's heart was so saddened by being rejected by those he loved that he began to go mad. Love turned to hatred and resentment, and Zerofuku literally became heartless, so he no longer sought healing but wanted revenge on those who made him feel this way. Seeing a group of humans, he ran towards them to kill them, but seeing that a kind mother tried to sacrifice herself for her children, Zerofuku became paralyzed, and his body split into seven beings. These agreed not to unite again to avoid the destruction of humans, and left the place. Back in the present, Zerofuku curses Buddha, and tells him that he will make him pay for what he did to him. Buddha answers him with a tremendous blow that puts Zerofuku on the ground, so the god feels humiliated again and begins to sadden. This makes his axe begin to grow in size, which attracts the attention of everyone in the audience. Then he begins to attack with incredible force, but Buddha dodges his attacks as if Zerofuku has lagged to hit. 
This infuriates and drives Zerofuku crazy, so his axe continues to grow, even more so as he hears everyone in the stadium muttering that he is a failure. Despite having a very large axe, he can't hit him at all, as Buddha dodges them as if he can see the future. Gaul watches this with admiration, so Brunhild explains to him that Buddha can see a few seconds into the future thanks to his enlightened state, and that thanks to this ability, he can see Zerofuku's every move. They all bow to Buddha's incredible ability, but their mouths drop open when they see that Zerofuku's axe has grown to the point where it is the size of the stadium. Buddha stood still upon seeing this, so everyone thought he gave up upon seeing this. But when Zerofuku whipped hard, Buddha used his staff to create a shield and protect himself, leaving Zerofuku ridiculed once again. Seeing that Buddha was able to withstand such an attack, Dahl asks Brunhilde how such a thing was possible, whereupon Brunhilde explains that Buddha's staff contains the power of the six guardians of the six realms, who guarded the spiritual paths of humans. After this, Zerofuku changes the shape of his weapon and turns it into a monstrous sledgehammer, so Buddha turns his staff into a bat and runs to knock Zerofuku down with one blow. After this, a flashback reveals Buddha's past, the most powerful teenager in history. Buddha was born Siddhartha Gautama, the prince of the Sakya clan, and the north of ancient India. He lived a life without needs and full of exclusivities. He had the best food, the most luxurious housing, and his future was prophesied by the gods, who determined that Siddhartha was going to rule the whole world in the future. He was loved by the people because of his generosity and kindness to the citizens, whom he treated as equals. One day he went to Mala, one of the six kingdoms of ancient India, to visit King Jataka. This young man was only five years older than him, and Siddhartha had an enormous appreciation for him, as they had developed an enormous appreciation. As they talked, Siddhartha congratulated his friend on the prosperity of his kingdom, but Jataka tells him that he regrets having devoted so much effort to his task, as his body has become seriously ill and he has never known life outside the palace. This leaves Siddhartha speechless, who feels strange to hear his friend's words. Soon after, Jataka passed away, and Siddhartha went to his farewell ceremony. Seeing all the people pouring for the king, Siddhartha does not hold back the tears. But hearing one of his men mention that Jataka was a lucky man, Siddhartha remembered his friend's words and finally understood them. Immediately, he felt enlightenment and took off his mourning garments. Then, he arrived at the solemn ceremony throwing flowers and shocking everyone, took Jataka's coffin, and carried it away. Then, he placed it in the river that Jataka wished to know and gave him an emotional farewell. After this, he left the palace, his wife, his royal robes, and marched through life living in enlightenment. On the way, he met different people trying to live a spiritual life being guided by abusive teachers, so he was filled with disciples, as Buddha could not allow others, whether gods or humans, to impose a destiny on others. Back in the present, Brunhild explains to Gaul that this is why Buddha rebelled against the gods. Zerofuku keeps attacking viciously, but Buddha keeps dodging with great class, so the two switch weapons and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Buddha's moves seem so superior that he dazzles the onlookers, but they continue to fuel Zerofuku's rancor, and his sword continues to grow and mutate. However, Buddha tells Zerofuku that he should not let the opinion of others affect him, as they are not the ones who give value to his life nor should he feel valuable because of what they say, but he should love himself. This leaves Zerofuku open-mouthed, but seeing that Buddha tells him that he feels affection for him, the demonic god changes his form again, and they both shed their weapons and begin to fight merrily. Buddha knocks Zerofuku down with one punch, and everyone is surprised to see that the god is not only back to his original form, but is smiling at feeling happy again. Buddha looks affectionately at the one who was chosen as his rival, but suddenly, Zerofuku's horns violently attack him and pierce his brain, taking possession of his body and making him mutate grotesquely. Buddha's fear and amazement leave him perplexed, as he evidently saw the future before everyone in the stadium. A gigantic and fearsome god named Papias appears in the ring and leaves everyone petrified. Buddha looks intently at Papias and asks him what has happened to Zerofuku, to which he replies that he has disappeared from the universe and no longer exists. Buddha asks him why he has done that and what he wants, but he replies that all he wants is to measure his strength. In the Greek god's box, Hades arrives and astonishes everyone with his presence, since he never visits Valhalla. After this, 
He explains that Polias is someone very famous in Helheim. A voiceover narrates that the world is composed of three dimensions in all mythologies. Valhalla, where the gods are, Midgard, where humans live, and finally, Helheim, also known as the Underworld. Hades epslica them that Papias is the most famous legend circulating in the Underworld, and that even he has not seen him in person, as it was believed that he was to become present when the darkest shadow combined with the brightest light. Thus, it is revealed that Papias is literally the embodiment of evil and darkness, who entered Zerofuku's body thanks to his horns. After staring at Buddha for a while, Papias begins to violently attack him with a flurry of attacks that the enlightened sage manages to match. Gaul thinks that Buddha is so incredible that he keeps using his enlightenment to dodge, but Brunhilde explains to him that this is impossible, since Buddha's enlightenment allows him to see the future thanks to the brightness of every soul. But Papias is pure evil and darkness, and there is not a shred of light in him, so Buddha is not able to anticipate his moves. Papias is surprised that Buddha has been able to stand up to him, so he tells him that he will attack him with all his might to see if he is able to resist. After channeling a monstrous blow, the entire stadium was silenced to see that Buddha's shield was not able to resist the attack, and the sage was wounded in one of his eyes. Seeing this, Papias recognized that he did not expect Buddha to survive that blow, but immediately afterwards he began to attack that side to take advantage of Buddha's disadvantage. The stadium fell silent, as they had never seen Buddha being subdued like that. Hades explains that he did not believe Papias existed, as legend has it that Papias destroyed half of the underworld just for fun before leaving. Furthermore, Hades reveals that he did not believe in that legend since it happened long before he started ruling the underworld. Everyone wonders the reason for Papias' presence, so Hades explains that only one idea comes to his mind. Probably someone took Papias' DNA and subjected it to treatment, and then introduced it into Zerofuku without him noticing. The only one capable of doing something like that, according to Hades, is Beelzebub. Papias keeps threatening Buddha to punish him, which keeps making the young sage disown himself, as it goes against his philosophy of life. Buddha believes that Zerofuku is still inside Papias, and starts talking to him to tell him not to be dominated by anyone. But Papias tells him that he did not lie to him when he told him that Zerofuku does not exist anymore, as he devoured him. This infuriates the Buddha, who feels a feeling he thought he had overcome, hatred. Because of this, his staff changes form again in a transformation that even he did not know about. The anticipation is sky high, and the two begin to fight as equals. But although Buddha manages to violently penetrate Papias' defenses, he is rammed by his sword and is seriously wounded. So the demon tells him to give his parting words to the audience, which makes Buddha laugh. Buddha continues to brandish his weapon and manages to wound Papias. He tries to demoralize Buddha, but the sage literally turns his cards over and tells him that he knows he is afraid, making the demon even more enraged, who remembers that his power was so great that his body could not resist it in the past. But now he tries to convince himself that things will be different. However, Buddha's boldness makes Papias tremble with fear, making him feel something he did not even understand. However, in an attempt to control the fear that has taken hold of him, he tears off his arm and transforms it into a powerful sword. Buddha leaps to the attack with all his fury, but Papias breaks his sickle and then breaks Buddha's staff. The fight seems to have come to an end, as Buddha has no divine weapon to harm Papias, besides the fact that he fell unconscious. However, Buddha begins to feel a halo of light around him and comes to. After this, he starts laughing loudly and silences the stadium. Then he takes Zerofuku's weapon and unties his hair in the coolest way ever, as if it were Holland. Zerofuku's soul embodies what used to be his weapon and becomes a kind of Valkyrie for Buddha. Now instead of feeding on misfortune, Zerofuku's weapon absorbs Buddha's love and becomes an extremely cool sword. Then Buddha jumps violently to attack Papias, and the two fight with all their might. Papias continues to feel fear as he sees that Buddha seems not to perish or feel frightened, even though he has been on the verge of death and defeat. However, everyone in the stadium believes that Buddha is lost, since despite his determination, no one can fight for much in such conditions, much less if he has lost one of his eyes. At that moment, Hades makes it clear to his companions that Buddha already has the fight in his hands, as he can see Papias' attacks again. Gaul notices the same thing, so Brunhild explains to him that Buddha has sown fear in Papias, so human feelings have created a little light in the demon, a light that Buddha can see to predict his movements. 
This makes Papias desperate, so he begins to attack with all his might. However, Buddha performs the last and most epic move of the entire anime to end the fight once and for all, and defeat the seemingly invincible foe. Papias is defeated, and Buddha watches in tears as Zerofuku's soul departs to rest in peace. The score of the tournament is even, and the stadium's expectations are sky high. After this, Buddha leaves the stadium to a standing ovation and meets the Valkyries but faints instantly. Then he is carried on a stretcher to be treated, but tells Brunhild to calm down and to trust in the power of humans to win the next fights. Meanwhile, the gods deliberate about the next representative, but Hades interrupts them and states that he will be in charge of provoking the inequality in the score. On the other hand, when Gaul learns of this, she trembles with fear, but Brunhild reassures her and tells her that there is an ideal opponent to face the king of the underworld. The season ends with the hype on a high by showing Chin, who is known as the first king, and was chosen to represent the humans. The end. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon to get new anime recaps.